I got the pleasure, the luxury of being able to interview one of the legends of the game, Mr. Lecrae. Give it up for him. As you can see, he's already trying to win you guys over. He's got the Harvard School of Business swag on. It's not fake. I really did spend some time at Harvard. So I'm just, you know, just saying. It's really real. It's real. So how was your trip up? I know it was a little, the weather was crazy. You guys got through smooth. Everything was good. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I guess when they call this New England, it's because the weather like literally came from England because it's like the same weather like over there. So it's crazy. Is it summertime still? Yeah. yeah. This is about, it's going to get a little bit hot. It actually hasn't really been any much hotter than this right now. So we were in Atlanta la uh, last week, four days ago or something like that. We did an event, summer playlist, crazy business. We did a, we did a listening party for the, for the project. It sounds insane. Uh, shout out to Build Your Own Dreams. Did an event for these guys, and it was amazing. Tell us a little bit about the summer playlist project. Have you guys, did you guys catch any of that? Any little snippets on there? Oh, tell them a little bit about the playlist. Uh, yeah, the summer playlist is something that, uh, for those who don't know, I have a record label called Reach Records, where many of your favorite uh, hip hop artists come out of. Folks like Andy Mineo and uh, Trip Lee, RG, um, you know, Hovey. And uh, we loved, I, I, I've been doing this for so long, I just want to make sure that I give artists an opportunity to use their gifts uh, to honor the Lord. And uh, we created this playlist where we highlight different artists from around the world. Um, and, uh, and you know, we get the best and the brightest music out there and they get exposure and they get fans and it's amazing and lives get changed. So, uh, Summer Playlist 21 comes out later on this month, so stay tuned. Stay tuned, got to hear some of the records. Uh, this time you guys added on, a, like you said, a bunch of other people, which I thought was amazing. Um, I know you guys, I saw Reese was on there, a, a hidden gem in Atlanta. Tell us about some of the other features and how you guys end up choosing because everybody wants to be on a Reach Records playlist. We're not going to kid ourselves. I, I sent in my 16. It didn't make the cut. We're going to talk about that later. But how does one get on the radar of you and Reach Records to get on something like that playlist? Yeah, I mean, it's a combination. One, I think, is, is, is how people are stewarding their circle of influence and their music and their gifts. And then two is people that we've had a chance to invest in personally. Um, so there's a lot of artists out there that aren't signed to Reach, but... Um, you know, come to Bible studies and come to outreaches and, um, you know, Reese did some time at uh, City Takers in Atlanta, just serve the people. And, uh, you know, you, when you see hearts like that, you want to get behind them and, um, and encourage them in their gifts. Okay, so you got to be a Christian. <laughs> well, I mean, hopefully, yes. Uh, so, yes. I mean, you know, I don't know. Only God knows, but yeah. <laughs> Step one, let's, let's try to be Christians to get on the Christian hip hop labels. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I mean, we can start there. It's an interesting question, Christian hip hop. I mean, we, we know it's been a debate. It's been, it's been something we talk about, the different parameters, what makes you an artist. In your heart, in your, in your mind, what is CHH? What does CHH mean to the world? What does CHH mean to the kingdom? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, titles are good in a lot of ways, right? So, um, you know, knowing is this spicy chicken or regular chicken is helpful. Uh, for delineation. But I think as it pertains to the kingdom, we have to be careful because the only title that, you know, will stand the test of time is a follower of Christ, right, is, is being a Christian. And so, um, you know, there's always, you know, there were, there was different movements throughout history. And, you know, we want to just make sure Christ is at the center. And so I think in this day and time, people think, when they think of Christian hip hop, they think of Christians who make music um, you know, for the express purpose of honoring God and, and serving people, and, and that's great, and I think that's what it should be. But, you know, times change, and so, you know, if all of a sudden Christian hip-hop means, because I've heard some people say this, like, yeah, it's just music that doesn't cuss. It's like, well, is that what it really is? You know, is that the, the limitations of it? So we just want to make sure that um, we're keeping a focus on Christ, and no matter what people call it, um, that we, we're demonstrating, you know, what the changes that have happened in us and it's reflecting in the music. Yeah. yeah. I, I get the feeling. Go ahead. go ahead, show them some love for that. That's a good answer. We all, we all want to know, we all go through this battle because I, I'm an accountant by day trade. And when people ask me what I'm doing, if I say I'm an accountant, everybody's cool with that. Right? And I don't have to say I'm a Christian accountant. And it would be kind of odd if I did. Let's, let's just go ahead and admit that. If you're a, you're, I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm a Christian teacher. Well, actually, you're a math teacher. 
and you, you teach math, so you can qualify yourself however you want. But as a, as a rapper, as an artist, when you say, I'm a hip-hop artist, immediately people are like, well, I mean, are you a Christian hip-hop artist? Like, it's, is, is that, and so I don't know where we draw the line, but we get this impressed upon us all the time. And I've had the pleasure in, in, in sometimes pain of watching you have to try to navigate this space. Over, as I've been involved in the genre for 10 plus years, I've been throwing concerts for 10 years, marketing, managing for 10 years. And to have to sit back and watch how people attack, how people uh, add their own measurements, their own, how many times you say Jesus in this song, or he didn't mention the gospel in this song per se, and they, they qualify you. And it's just, it's been so hard for me to watch that. And so I can't, I can't even possibly imagine how challenging it's been for you. So I just want to say for all the people out there, we have to show this man some love. Give him his flowers for what he does for the culture. Firstly, firstly, you don't got to say nothing. Just take it. Just go ahead and love it. Just go ahead and love it. So I want to go back to 2012. 2012 was a good year for you. 2012, church closed one. Yeah, okay. I was like, wait, what happened? Yeah, let, me, let me help you out. I saw you looking. 2000, 2012, church closed volume one comes out. Revolutionizes, in my opinion, what we consider to be Christian hip hop. You changed the way people perceived what a Christian hip hop artist could say, what they could do with the church clothes. With the video in the church, you weren't street clothes, um, kind of breaking through these barriers. I, as a young guy, see this. I go to an old school church, everybody wears suits. I walk in with jeans and a t shirt, they think I'm not saved anymore. So to see that on television, I know some of y'all there, you, she go to that church too. Were you there last week? She, <laughs> she go to that church. But then later in the year, you drop Gravity. You guys heard Gravity? Rapzilla called Gravity the most important project to ever come out in the Christian hip hop space. Did you know that? I didn't know that. So Gravity is the first record that Lecrae drops. And, and the entire industry, Christian hip hop culture, hip hop culture has galvanized to this moment. It has all kind of come to a, like to a crescendo, I would say. In the entirety of, of the space, I myself, all, everyone I know bought Gravity because we knew that this was going to be a moment. And it went number one on the charts, and it was the first time a, a hip -hop, Christian hip-hop artist had done this, and we're all shocked. Did you know that Gravity had that weight to it? Did you know that it was going to be that big a moment? That it had that gravity to it? <laughs> um, I, I, that was a layup. No, I... I you know, it's funny that you mentioned some of the things that you said earlier about um, the, the rules and what you can do and, and, and all of those particular things because you have to remember that being a musician is not an official office of the church. And so people kind of have all kinds of ideas about what you should and shouldn't do, what you can and can't do. And I would always liken it to like um, when you look in the scriptures, you have priests, and priests have very specific roles. Like, you wear this, you don't wear this, you go to the temple, you use this in the temple, you do this. And the priests always have these very scripted out roles, but there's no, like, rules or script for a king or just a, a follower. And so the, these leaders in the scripture didn't have laid out rules. It was just like, keep your way pure, follow the word. It wasn't like scripted out as like, this is how you have to do it. Like elders in the scriptures, this is what an elder does. Bang, 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 bang. So there were not like this set of rules that I could find anywhere that said, hey, this is how you have to make this kind of music or this kind of album. Um, oftentimes, we like to put rules on stuff. Like we love to do that. Like, uh, you got to say Jesus seven times per song, otherwise it's not any good or things like that. And... I just wanted to do something that I felt like would reach the folks who couldn't see, like they, they couldn't see Jesus through all of the, the rules and the language. I just wanted them to see like the heartbeat of a person who was transformed, to hear the voice of somebody who needed Christ and um, in, in real time. And so that's why I was making that project. That's why I did Church Clothes, why I did Gravity. So I had no idea the impact it would have, but um, but I wanted it to to hit people and and to make waves. So you didn't know. So so gravity. Just let's, let's just run through this real quick. Best gospel album for the 2013 Grammys. Is yeah. that your first Grammy? It Grammy? was yeah. first Grammy. Christian hip hop artist ever win a Grammy. Yeah. Come on now, mainstream. He on TV, y'all. He's on BET that year. Uh, 
Dove Awards Rap Hip Hop Album of the Year. Wow. Tell the World Rap Hip Hop Recorded Song of the Year. Wow. Best Rap Hip Hop Gospel CD of the Year at the Stellars. <laughs> In the top Christian album at the 2013 Billboard Music Awards. I had no idea. You know more than I know. <laughs> and he doesn't even know. He doesn't even know. So that, that already puts you, for all those people who are like, you know, Clay, Cray's clout chasing, Cray wants to be famous. He doesn't even know what happened. So you wake up the morning of gravity. You see your number one. The inauguration has taken place. For the Christian hip-hop artists, you have achieved uh, self-actualization, right? You've achieved this point of, of no return, of success, that everybody would then, from this, that point on, would gauge their success by. How challenging is that for people to say, have you heard of Christian hip-hop? And a friend says no, and they say, well, have you heard of Lecrae? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah that, that's Christian hip-hop. You become the banner. What is that like? That's tough. That's a very tough thing to wear because you're now, um, you know, people tend to lift you up so high only for them to watch you fall, right? Like, then they love to exalt you and throw rocks at you to see if, if you'll fall. And it was very difficult because everyone has a different standard of how you should be and how you should carry yourself and what you should say. And, um, and, and so, yeah, I think that was tough just to be like, oh. But I, it's taught me a lot because I think that as far as Christians making music, I feel like there are Christians who make music from the church to the world. And... Um, and that's what they do. It's like you don't necessarily know them as like, oh, they make Christian music, but they make music from the heart of a believer to the world. And that would be somebody like my good friend Tori Kelly, right, who's amazing. She's making music from the church to the world. Um, there are Christians who make music from the church for the church, right, to edify worship songs, you know, some of the, the biggest, you know, songs like that. Shout out to Maverick City, you know, some of my good friends, right? Um, and then there are, are individuals who make music as believers and it makes obviously it encourages the church but the world looks at them peculiarly like wow this is christian and i feel like that's kind of the category i found myself in is is it's almost like you're redefining things for people right it's like oh okay that's interesting i didn't know that that christians could do that and um and so that was a task because when you're redefining things pioneers get all the scrutiny and none of the <laughs> you know, the, uh, you know, applause or anything like that. It's just like, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing? You know, and so I was like, and, and we're like, I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> Lord help. <laughs> you know, so so you're, the, you're the first person to go through kind of these things. Because, again, we're talking about prior to that, we have what? We've, we have cross movement. Um, you know, we have DC Talk. You know, they're still, they're still calling it Toby Mac the greatest Christian hip-hop artist. I, I don't know. I mean, I, there might be some... Toby Mac is a legend, Toby, Toby He's Mac a legend in his own right. So he's I that guy. But for me growing up, he wasn't the standard. Yeah, he's in. It's, it's kind of a different genre. Hip-hop is like an umbrella. He fits in a different side of, of it. But yes, it's like he's pop in, rap. That's yeah, what I he's, in, he's in a different stratosphere. But yeah. so for you, again, so you're going to the, to, the, to the BET Awards. You're going to the Billboard Awards. No one's ever done this before. What was your first moment when you were like, you were walking onto a stage or something like that, and you're just like... What the heck is going on? Like, is this really life? At first, I had a chip on my shoulder. I'm not going to lie to you. I was like, I'm going to show all of you that we Christians know how to do this. Like, oh, we're just as... I had this chip on my shoulder. I'm not going to lie to you. So I just I was just wanted to kick in the door because it, everywhere you go, they thought we were corny. They thought we... I mean, I got made fun of so many times at radio stations. I would walk in a mainstream station. They'd be like, oh, where's your choir robe at, man? You know, or just like, did you bring us some communion? And it was just poke, 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 and just make fun of me behind the scenes all the time. And I just had this chip on my shoulder. I remember going to a, a team practice, an NBA team, and the coach was a Christian, and he was like, hey, we got Lecrae here. He does gospel rap, and he got some free CDs for all y'all. And they were like, I don't know why listen to my gospel rap. And it was like, no one would even give me a chance. You know, it was like, Christian rap, C rap spells crap. You know, it was like, man. So it was just tough. And so I had a, a big chip on my shoulder. So I would walk in these events. I go to BT or I go to, you know, MTVs and all that stuff. And I was like, I'm going to show y'all. Like, God gave us gifts too, and y'all going to see. 
Um, so it, it, you know, it took a minute for me to like calm down and just, you know, like just try to see things from a different vantage point. But yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, so you talked about the point we've esteemed you, right? With, you know, the audiences for, for Christianity, you've become the, the poster boy, you've become the banner and everyone's admiring. But at some point as we're watching the progression of the music, um, an acute fan notices by the time we get to all things work together, we can tell that like something's happening, right? Mm -hmm. That something's changed, that there's been some hurt, um, that there's been some challenges. And you put out for me at that mo moment, my favorite song, Can't Stop Me Now. Like there's just the most, which is clearly just like the, you're just crying out and it's in such a real way. And, and I really felt that song, like what was happening between that moment of coronation, right? So you get to this point where you can just tell that there's just, so much weight on you. It's the lowest point of my life. I mean, that album is definitely the lowest point in my entire existence. Um, and it, it was a lot happening. Um, I think to make it clear, uh, the best way I could paint it is, you know, when you look at Matthew and you see Jesus talk about persecution, um, you see, you know, Peter or James or Paul talk about persecution. Um, you know, Christ talks about it happening in the synagogue. And I never caught that until like recently that it's, it's oftentimes the religious that will persecute you. And it's not always the people outside of the church, it's the religious. And I faced persecution like none other from the church or from those who would say they were the church for a multitude of different reasons. Um, one, obviously, I wanted to reach people. I felt like I was a missionary and sometimes being a missionary means you make unorthodox moves. You you know you dress up and you 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 get out into the culture. And so, me collaborating with folks who were not Christians, um, which I saw a lot of fruit from behind the scenes. But you know I was definitely um, chastised heavily for that. Called fake. I'm part of the Illuminati. All kinds of crazy things. Um, standing up for human rights. You know for the rights of of uh, individuals from marginalized communities. Um, an African-American community um, and just saying, man, these are people made in the image of God and we should care about these folks. Um, I faced a lot of persecution for that. And, you know, people said, oh, you're, you're political now. You're, you're, you're not, you don't care about the gospel. And I was like, no, the implications of the gospel is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so that's me caring about the gospel. Um, and so, you know, it was definitely, uh, you know, just uh, uh, attacked on that. A lot of lies or be, get made up, you know, everything you do now gets seen from that lens, right? If somebody, somebody accuses you and says, hey man, you're a, you know, you're, you, you know, you're a New York Yankees fan. You're like, no, I'm not, I promise I'm not, right? You say, I'm not, a, you say, you're not, right? And they accuse you of that. And then all of a sudden, you know, um, I don't know, you're wearing blue and they're like, see, I told you, he's a Yankees fan. Or, you know, somebody, uh, a, a Yankees player is having a conversation with you and now all of a sudden, I told you, he's a freaking Yankees fan. And that's the stuff that would continuously happen to me is like people just building evidence on, upon something else and just assuming your motives all the time. So that album was birthed out of all of that just pain and, um, and me, and I called it All Things Work Together, not because I wanted all things to work together, or I believed it because I needed to believe that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Yeah. My favorite, long, favorite line from that song is, uh, I spoke my mind and got attacked for it. I guess I'm just another black boy. You tell me what, what inspired that line specifically? Um, so we, we, we got to get deep on this one. Um, America's interesting because America has this construct that has been created. I mean, it was created in, in Europe, but it really took off in America called race. And race is a construct. It's not really a real thing, right? It's not even something that God would acknowledge, something that we created to uphold a caste system. And a caste system, you know, exists in India. You know, have some people, if you're born here, you're this level, you're born here, you're this level. And in America and in the West, um, historically, um, there was this idea that how do we delineate between who is here and who is here, and it became easier to do that over time based off of color, right? Because if, 
it, we started with like, well, it's the Irish and the Italians, but then it's like, well, I don't know, the, you know, they blended in. And, and there's blending and blending and blending and blending keeps happening to where eventually everyone can function in this upper caste, but there's no way I can blend in with an Italian, right? And so we have this, this thing, this construct called race, and there's nothing I can do to change the way that I look, but societally, we can't unsee it, and we shouldn't. Like, God made us all uniquely with different hair colors and eye colors and skin colors. It's great. He did that on purpose. We're reflecting the image of God. You don't want to not see color. You want to see it because you're saying, look at how God did this. This is beautiful. But when we start to see color as a part of a caste or worth type of thing, um, then it creates problems in society. And, you know, we have... In our construct, we call black and white. That's what we essentially call it. We say, oh, you're black and you're white. Um, and we've been running with this for centuries, this idea of black and white for centuries. And historically, black means lesser than. It means you're not as good as. It means, and, and a stereotype gets baked into our minds to where even black people believe it, right? And so it's like, well, I'm, I'm lesser than. I might as well act lesser than. And so I thought if anybody could see past this, if anybody could say, you know what, we're all made in the image of God, praise God for our, our rainbow of colors, but we need to listen to each other, empathize, bear one another's burdens, it would be the body of Christ. I just knew that Christians would see that and get that, and I, I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. I was, I was gravely misunderstood because obviously Christians aren't perfect people. And so there's a lot of tension there and a lot of struggle. And I saw a lot of people choose sides. And God doesn't take sides. He takes over. And we need to be on the side of God every time. So. I feel that so strongly. I mean, well, man, like you said, it's deep. It's, it's just heavy because, because we exist in these spaces, man. You know what I mean? If, if you're not in that space and you don't go through it every day, it's hard to, to correlate to it. I would never, the funny thing for me is like, if a, if, if a Martian walked in through the side door, right, and he came in and he's like, people are mean to me because I'm green, right? We'd be like, we'd probably be like, yo, that's crazy. People are mean to green people. What are we going to do? Let's help them. But when we cry out, we're black young men, and we, I swear, every, people, everywhere I go, like, it's different looks, it's different challenges. We get people who are like, nah, there's no way. It couldn't be. Right? And so that, I mean, that causes me pain. I tell my wife all the time, I work, in a, I work at BU. I'm one of the few young black men there. When I walk in the office, I try to hold the door for people. And there's just different ways that you just get looked at. And it, and it hurts my heart, right, to just to get those moments where I can tell that you're just not loving me because you're seeing me and you're just not loving me. And it causes me a great deal of pain. And so I can only imagine, again, for you to be at this place in this position and to have a, have a certain audience, you know, we don't have to get deep into the audience, but a certain audience really embrace you mm -hmm. and then you say certain things and you lose a big chunk of your audience. Yeah. What was that like? Um, well, yeah, I mean, obviously you're, you're trying to process it because you don't know if it's, if it's you. You're, you're confused because you thought you joined this big happy family. I, be, I didn't become a Christian until I was an adult. So I, I thought it was all kumbaya, hand holding. <laughs> so I'm like, wait, what? I don't understand. What, what, did, what did I do wrong? What did I say wrong? I'm just saying what I. And, and, you know, we have a very tried history as it pertains to race. Um, and even in Christianity, I think. What's happened for us is that we have, and I, I got to tell a story for this to make sense because we're going there. So um, if any of you guys, and I'll, I'll probably talk about it on stage as well, but, but, um, but, but Ben-Hur is a movie about a Jewish, um, a, a Jewish man centuries ago who was not supposed to participate in, in, in a chariot race because Jews don't do that, right? It's, it's sinful. The Romans do this, but the Jews don't. So he participated in it because he was, felt like he didn't have a choice. Um, it was frowned upon the Jewish community. And the Romans were all excited, to, you know, like, yeah, we're going to beat this Jew. And, you know, they're cheering. And he races against the Romans. And, you know, secretively, Jews are like, 
hey, yo, I think he might win. You know, you kind of get start getting excited, like, wait, wait, our guy might win. And then he eventually does win. And the Jews are excited about it now. Like, yeah, we beat Rome. We did it. We, we got Rome. And one of the, the officials comes up to the Roman leader at the time and he says, hey, how do you feel? I mean, I'm sorry that we let these Jews win. And he said, I don't care that they won. I just wanted them to play the game. Now that they are playing our game, we got them. And I think that's how Satan functions in our society. Um, we Christians are supposed to be about a kingdom, not an empire. Your nation is an empire. And God has not chosen any nation. He cares that God so loved the world. That's okay to love and be grateful for the nation you live in. But when you get so wrapped up in your nation or your empire and you forget the kingdom, we now have a problem. Because Satan doesn't care what sides you choose on the political aisle as long as you're more concerned about that than his kingdom. And I think what begins to... Amen. Amen. Um... And, and I think what begins to happen is people start, we start infighting. We start infighting because if you really love Jesus, then you care about these issues. And they say, no, you would care about these issues. Well, this group says feeding the poor is loving Jesus. And this group says um, saving the unborn is loving Jesus. Well, both of them are loving Jesus, right? And God is not sitting here saying, yeah, I really don't care about the widows and orphans as much as I care about the unborn babies, or I really don't care about the unborn babies as much as I care about the widows and orphans. He's not doing that. We as Christians are supposed to be so peculiar and so distinct that we're, we're not great political advocates because we really aren't, we're so into Jesus, we can't be that wrapped up in one particular viewpoint. And so... At the end of the day, when you start talking about issues that one side cares about, well, this side says, well, see, they're, they're moving over here. And you're like, no, I'm not. I'm just caring about the things God cares about. And then you say, well, I care about this thing. No, he's moving over to this side. No, I'm not. You know, I have the liberal left over here saying, man, he's, he's a sellout. I have the conservative right saying he's a sellout. And I'm like, I'm a Christ follower. I care about all of these things. So... All that to say, I think that was a lot of what I was experiencing and what I was feeling in that time period. And I just wanted people to, to see past um, what, what I feel like you know, Satan would use as a very divisive tool and a house divided can't stand. And so um, that's how you got what you got. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool, cool, cool. Um, they posted it, SoFest posted a quote. So I'm gonna ask you what you were thinking when you wrote this quote. The beginning of the new you is when you say, I've had enough. From your book. Well, what does that mean? Uh, it, it, you know, change happens when you're standing on the edge of a, something trying and you have to jump. And, and that's scary, right? Taking that leap of faith. I went to New Zealand and um, they have this 600 foot building and you base jump off of it. And, um, and I was like, oh, that would be crazy to do that. And, and somebody was like, challenge me, do it, Lecrae. I was like, ah, oh, I don't know. Uh, uh, but then I saw a video of Beyonce doing it. I said, if Beyonce can do it, I can do it. And that was stupid. Because Beyonce can do lots of things I can't do. So that's not even healthy logic. Um, so I get all the way to the top of this building and I'm standing up there and I'm freaking out and I'm looking down and I'm like, I'm not going to be able to do this. There's no way I can do this. And they said, it's not a big deal. If you can't do it, you just have to put on this shirt and it's got a chicken on it and you got to walk down the steps. And I was like, oh man, I can't go out like that. But then I looked over again. And I was like, I might have to put on this chicken shirt. And a 10 year old girl taps me and she's like, Will you mind if I go since you're taking so long? And then she jumps and I'm like, I got to do it. I got to jump. And so, you know, I stood over the edge of that thing and I said, there's only one way down from here. And it's going through it. And sometimes you have to go through that tunnel of chaos. You cannot become a butterfly from a caterpillar if you don't go through that cocoon. And that's what changes, you've got to be able to say, all right, we're not going back. We're going to become who God has created us to be, and we're going we're gonna to go through whatever this process looks like, as tough as it is, as difficult as it is to, to work through. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. So no chicken shirt. No chicken shirt. Yeah. Let's go.
Let's go. So, you know, when I knew you were going to be all right, because you care about when I thought that. Um, <laughs> I knew you were going to be all right after you guys all went on the Israel trip, right? Derek takes you guys on the, on, invites you to the Israel collective trip. You guys all go out there and have a life-changing experience. You come back, and you write this, like, long, formal apology. Like, Derek is one of my closest homies now. Like, he's there for me. My father passed away recently. Derek was the only one who called me, like, right after and was on the phone with me once a week. Just an amazing dude. And so you wrote this, like, long, formal apology to this guy. And I was just, I was so impressed because you did on IG the, for the world to see it. And I was just like, Dad, this dude is, this dude is going to be all right. Like, how did you get to a point where you could literally post that for the world to see and tell us about Israel and, like, that impact that it had on you? Um, well, yeah, I think, um, you know, people will say, man, God changed my life. And you're like, where? You know, like, what? what Where's the evidence? I, if, if I went outside right now and, and I, I came back in and I said, y'all, it's crazy. I just got hit by an 18-wheeler. You would be like, where? You know, because I'm walking in here. I look normal. If you've been impacted by something like it, it's the size of an 18-wheeler, you're going to look different. <laughs> you're not walking in here like that. Um, and if you've been impacted by someone as big as God, you're going to look different. It's, you're not going to be the same. And um, yeah, so so Israel was like 12 18 wheelers and a tornado and a hurricane just just destroyed me um, to sit in the places that, you know, Christ sat to look, you know, over at the views that he looked at to walk the trails that he walked. Um, it just did something to you to make you realize he he was here, you know, it it brings new words to the idea I know my redeemer lives like he's real he lived he died he resurrected and I have all of this physical evidence the bible's not just a book like these are real places you could trace them like a map and I was just blown away and I was like lord I don't want to play with this thing you know I don't want to sugarcoat this um you know the um revelations talks about you know, I'd rather you be hot or cold and not lukewarm. And oftentimes I think we mess that verse up because in Laodicea, they had cold water, which was useful for your thirst and, and, and to cleanse your palate. And then they had hot water, which was the hot springs would be used to bathe and to heal wounds, right? So the cold water was useful. The hot water was useful. But lukewarm water generally meant it was stagnant. It sat outside, which means it was prey to bacteria and prey to diseases. And so what do you do when you drink water full of bacteria and diseases? It makes you vomit. I will spit you out of my mouth. And so God is just asking us to be hot or cold, be useful, not stagnant. And I was like, Lord, I want to be useful. I want to be water that brings, you know, um, refreshment to people or healing to people, but I don't want to just be this pond gaining bacteria and making people sick. And so that's what Israel did for me. It just made me say, oh, we've got to turn the notch up and not go back. Yeah. All right. All right. So we only got about 10 minutes left. So I want to give you guys an opportunity. Oh, she's already got her hand up. I want to give you guys... <laughs> She said YOLO. She got the YOLO shirt on. Uh, give you guys an opportunity to ask a question. Um, I think I'm going to start here. You have a question? I think you have a question. You want to ask? You think you could yell it out for us? This is kind of intimate. <laughs> do you ever struggle with insecurity? If so, how do you find confidence? Yes, absolutely. Um, I would I would imagine that most people's um, whatever their mantra is is their struggle, right? So my mantra is: if you live for their acceptance, you'll die from their rejection, which is a big banner for insecurity, right? If you live for their acceptance, you'll die from their rejection. And living for people's acceptance is like the key is the root of insecurity. It's like, I just want people to like me. That's why it hurt so bad when everyone turned on me and it was like, oh, what did I do? Um, and so, yes, um, I have deep-rooted insecurity from being abandoned by my father, 
uh, from being raised in an abusive environment growing up. It made me feel as if I had to earn my worth and my value. And the way that I stave off that insecurity is I, I you know, look at something like Isaiah 40 where I see how big God is and everything that he created and how massive and powerful and important and glorious he is. And then I look at something like John 3, 16 and, and, and realize, oh, he loves me. Or Ephesians, you know, 2, 10, where it says, I'm the workmanship of God, right? God is so big, he created the heavens, the moon, and the stars, but he's so intimate and caring that you and you're so important to him that he wants to know you intimately and personally and allow, allow his spirit to live within you. Um, and that really just, you know, helps me wrestle with my own insecurities like, psh, the creator of creation knows me, loves me, has given me infinite worth. I'm just as important as anybody in the room, no matter what they have going on. Um, and so I can talk for a long time. I gotta tell one more story. I know y'all got some questions, but I just, one, one story is funny. I was in LA, I got invited to this big like LA party, like Kanye and everybody's there. And so I'm like, oh man, I'm, let me at least get a shirt that says I belong here. So I go to Rodeo Drive, uh, on Beverly Hills, I go in the store, I'm looking for a shirt, and I found a t-shirt, I'm like, this should work, right? I grab a t-shirt, I look at the price, I said, something's wrong. Um, they put the wrong price on this shirt. And so I literally thought this, and I went to the front desk, and I was like, excuse me, ma'am, I think they have the wrong price on this shirt. I just need to grab this, like, what's the regular price for this? And she said, you are so right, it says 600, it's 900, it's upside down. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, what is in this shirt? Like, will I become a superhero? Do I grow wings? Like, what? How? What is this? And she told me, she said, it's not really the material. It's made of cotton like any other shirt. It's the designer's name on it that makes it more valuable. And man, that hit me like a ton of bricks. It's not what I do or what I'm... It's the designer's name on me that gives me value. So may that be hopeful for you. Wow, that was good. That's a good. That's a banger. All right. I did not buy that shirt. Hey! <laughs> I did not. <laughs> I, I said I was just gonna have to go as I am. Lord, <laughs> be my wardrobe tonight. <laughs> See, if he was an Illuminati, he would have got the shirt. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, that's the funny thing about it is I think people have this tendency to believe that because you have a, 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 a global platform that you are adverse to advice or I actually love when I'm confronted. Like it's one of my favorite because it lets me know you care. And I hate when people talk about me behind my back, especially like friends. I'm like, why didn't you call me? Like I get so frustrated by that. And so I've had some good brothers who really have just said, man, I, can I talk to you? And I, I, you know, of course I'm gonna always like, okay, so when you say that, do you mean like, what do you mean? Or how does this work? Or, But that's how I grow. Um, some of my, I, I, I think everyone needs a Jonathan in their life. You know, somebody who's like, I love you no matter what. You know, your face is twisted, it's spit coming out of your mouth and I still love you. And you need a Nathan in your life who's gonna say, man, you are wrong. And I, I've been very blessed to have some great Nathans in my life who, Help me. I think it's important to have people who care about you challenge you versus people who, you know, they never have anything good to say or constructive to say. They only have negative things to say about you. Um, but I, but I really respect um, some of the voices who have challenged me and um, and pushed back on some of the things. I think, yeah. Anybody else? Any other questions? Right here. Oh, top sorry, two. you pick. Oh, no, I was just saying to some up top, too. Oh. I saw that. Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, he was asking, like, what do you do when you want to give up? Um, first thing I would say is, is um, admitting that you want to give up is, like, huge. Because most people won't admit that. They won't tell anybody. They won't even, you know, they'll fight that reality. And some of the greatest characters in Scripture wanted to give up. They wanted to throw in a towel. You think about Elijah. It's like, yo, just kill me, Lord. I'm ready to go, you know? Um I think for me, what I've learned is um, any faith worth having is a faith worth doubting. 
right? If it's, if it's that good, you got to twist it around and turn it around and say, wait, because if it's really as good as it says it is, your doubt's not going to make a difference. It's so potent and powerful and real. And, um, and so in my moments of doubt, I continue talking to God. I'm, I look at David in the scriptures, and David never says, I ain't talking to you no more. I'm done. I'm out. He doesn't do that. He says, where are you? Where are you at? I'm struggling. And, and I believe that God is so compassionate. He wants to hear from us in our low moments, just like cry out. Like, it's better to at least cry out to God in your low moments than to pretend like he's not there or to act as if he doesn't, he's not there anymore. Continue crying out. In, in the Hebrew, they call it, um, or a Jewish context, they call it chutzpah. You got some chutzpah. You got some, some ugh, like, I'm not quitting. I'm going to just beat your door down, God. And it's almost like Abraham, you know, when, when he's like, God's like, yo, I'm about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham's like, um, wait a minute, but can you like, what if, what if this many people were there? I wouldn't destroy. Okay, 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 I hear what you're saying. What about this many people? Oh, oh, what about this many people? And I think that's what God is after. He wants us to have that kind of chutzpah, that nerve, like the nerve of you. God, If you're where are you at, Lord? I, you say your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I don't feel it. You know, you, and you hold him to his promises because he's not a man, so he's not going to break his. And I think God, God hears that and he sees that and he responds to that nerve that of like a kid. It's like, you know, when you're a little kid and my, my, my youngest son is like, can I have a cookie? Can I have a cookie, daddy? Can I have a cookie, daddy? And I'm like, no, please can I have a cookie? Hold on, can I have a cookie, can I have a cookie? Can I have a... Yes, yes, yes. And I don't think God is annoyed, but I think it's like, it's, it's like just that sentiment of like, okay, all right, you got some nerve to sit here and just keep, keep coming at me. So I would say just keep coming, you know? Yeah. Hey, Amen. <laughs> All right, we got time for one more question. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get him right. Here. Actually, I'm gonna get the little girl back. Turn her hand up. I'm gonna get her after. I'm gonna get her after. Make, let's do it. What does my nightly call look like at home and I'm on the road? Man, you know what's funny? I remember, cause I'm old enough to remember a time when there was no FaceTime. I don't know if y'all know the youngins know what that's like. I'm old enough to remember before there was FaceTime. I remember when FaceTime came out and I was in line at the Apple Store. Like, I gotta get this because now I can see my family all the time. And, um, and man, it just became like a regular for us, you know, just a regular pattern of being able to communicate and being able to talk to my kids about their day and being able to talk to my wife about her day and, um, and just making that a priority. Um, and I think, I think a lot of times, you know, we don't make it a priority to, to keep you know, family-centeredness uh, as a part of what we would call ministry. We think about ministry as out there and not at home. And so it's extremely important for me. Um, another thing I started to do is take my kids. Matter of fact, my daughter was going to be on this trip, um, but uh, she had, like, um, uh, uh, volleyball camp. It's more important than hanging out in Northeast with Dad, apparently. Uh, so I, I like incorporating them um, as much as I can. Yeah. Thank you. Let's quick. Let's get your question. Come on. What inspired me to do rap? That's a great question. Um, you know what? When how old are you? Nine. So when I was when I was your age, actually, um, my uncles would let me watch videos and listen to songs that I probably shouldn't have been listening to. However, what? That Satan is used for his purposes, God has his own. So um, I listened to a lot of rap music as a kid. I loved it. I loved writing songs. I loved rapping. And so I did it all the time. And um, when I met the Lord, when I met Jesus, he changed my heart. And I started using music to honor him instead of just talking about um, how much, you know, how many lies I could tell in a song, all the silly stuff that I would typically talk about. So that inspired me. Yeah. Let's give it up for Lecrae. <laughs> Hopefully this interview helps you to see his heart, to understand where he's coming from. So the next time somebody says he's an Illuminati, you can say, no, he's not. I was there. He I can't me. even spell Illuminati, family. What's going on?